everyone, and welcome to this Pituity and Robert Half Quarterly Economic Update, part of our Tackling Tomorrow Today series for 2022. My name's Paul Middleton, and I'm joined here today by my colleagues from Pituity and our sister company, Robert Half. It's great to see you all here, and especially to see familiar names um, in the chat here. And thank you all to our regular attendees for making the technology leap from Microsoft Teams, our, our usual platform, to Zoom. Today, we'll be debating the future of our UK economy and the global economy. Last time John spoke with us back in December, we'd just been hit by the Omicron variant in the UK, causing borders to close, financial markets to wobble, masks to return, confidence to take a hit, and Christmas to be in jeopardy. Doesn't that seem a long way away now? Just three months later, and the world is facing some very different threats and some very troubling uncertainties which only seem to compound the challenges from which we were recovering. Naturally, so much of what John will be discussing today will touch on the continuing impact on the UK and global economies of the pandemic, the impact of COVID restrictions, which are continuing in some countries, and the tale of disruption and uncertainty that this has caused. But he will also be looking through the lens of the war in the Ukraine and the compounding impact that this is having on our UK and global economies which in many cases were already looking quite fragile. Like all of you here, I'm sure, our thoughts here at Paturity and Robert Half go out to everyone directly affected by the tragic events in the Ukraine. And we all hope and pray for, it, for the conflict to come to an end as soon as possible. We saw yesterday the UK government's response to some of the eye-watering economic figures. Inflation forecasted to be 7.4% this year, UK growth downgraded to 3.8%, an interest on debt repayments amounting to £83 billion a year. Was the UK government's response enough? Where are we heading? What other measures can we expect to see domestically and globally? And what does this mean for you, your family and your business? To answer all these questions, and more importantly, all your questions, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr John Ashcroft. As some of you may remember from his appearances on our collaboration forum, John specialises in economics, strategy and financial markets, working with professional firms, large corporates and small and medium enterprises. He's the author of The Saturday Economist, his weekly blog published on a website of the same name that some of you may already subscribe to, discussing the UK and world economy. I think my team will post a link to John's website in the chat. John specialises in viral modelling, and it's this combination of modelling and statistical fueled economics that has resonated with so many of you before. So particularly off the back of yesterday's spring statement, we thought that it would be great to bring you an update on John's insights, perspective, challenges, and hopefully his normal optimism as well, as we could all do with a bit of that. John will be presenting his thoughts using some slides, so if you have questions or comments, please post your questions in the chat as we go. Um, if you do post questions, you have the option of just posting to me as your host or to everyone. And I'd like you and I'd ask you please just to post to everyone, not, not just to me. In this format, you are all muted automatically, but would be delighted for you to come off mute and ask John a difficult question when he's finished his presentation. And to do that, please just put your hand up using the little icon at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen. And the, and, the, and the team we have around us here will unmute you and you'll be able to ask John your question. Um, we will be recording and sharing this rec um, the recording on email, YouTube, and on Robert Half and Fertility LinkedIn. Um, so please participate and use chat to pose your questions as, as there'll be plenty of time for that. John will speak for around 40 minutes. And so, as I say, after that, there'll be plenty of time, but please do get involved through chat or by coming off of mute, being bold, asking a question or letting us know your thoughts as you getting involved is infectious and ultimately this is your forum so you can guide it where you want to go and ask the questions you want to hear. So, John, great to see you again. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Paul. Good morning, Paul, and good morning to everybody. Uh, such a lot to get through this morning, but uh, we're gonna make a start. We'll be talking about the world economy. Uh, we'll also be focusing on the UK economy and we'll also be looking at or commenting on the Chancellor's spring statement yesterday. So I'm going to pull up my slide deck, technology allowing. Um, and here we go. So if I share this to myself first and press play. And away we go. So we're going to be talking about tackling tomorrow uh, today. And we're looking, as I say, about the world outlook, uh, the UK outlook and 
uh, the market summary, but also the Chancellor's um, uh, spring statement yesterday. Really, the evidence is we're going to be talking about lower growth. We'll be talking about higher inflation. Labour market is still mixed at the moment because in the US and the UK, uh, analysts and government are still very positive about the market outlook and also the implications of higher interest rates because higher interest rates are coming. Yes, we are leaving planet ZERP as we've been talking about for some years now. So we're leaving planet ZERP. Fasten your seatbelts, but don't forget your cancellation insurance because the central bankers could change their mind at any stage. So we know there's been a pandemic shock. We dealt with that. And that led to the economic shock. We dealt with that. That led to the seismic shock uh, between supply and demand, which we talked about previously. And then we had the first round of the inflation shock. Then to follow the monetary shock. And now the shock of war. But central bankers are grappling with the challenge of dealing with inflation and the challenge of interest rates. So here's Ed Conway talking to the governor with a tough question. There's, there's this kind of internet meme, I don't know if you've seen it, you had one job. Well, the Bank of England has one job, keeping inflation under control. And yet your target's 2%, hmm. you're looking at inflation being 7%. So have one job yes uh, yeah yeah so no tough questions for me like that today please so we talked about the seismic shock this dislocation between demand and supply which was happening through last year as the western economies recovered and supply difficulties were in place we also saw in the us this concept of helicopter money we're not talking about qe here but the fact that money was checks were being sent signed by uh, trump and also by biden pumping money into the economy unless this led to the the tsunami of dollars, especially in the USA, which created the, the sort of first round inflation effect leading on to the commodity price shock. Then, of course, we had the shock of war with the appalling invasion of Ukraine. And generally now we're thinking this is a great miscalculation for Putin. He was faced with the shock of the, the encroaching um, development of NATO. And what he wanted to do was develop his buffer states from Crimea to Kaliningrad, and also from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea. But he failed to realise, he thought the NATO allies were going to be split, he failed to recognise the strength of the Ukraine resistance, and the quick reaction. And what we've got to do is put Putin in perspective, because here is our global map of GDP, and in the bottom right section as I look at it, this is the Russian economy. And we have to put Putin in perspective. Basically, he's now involved in a burr hug, big squeeze on the Russian economy. And we've got to recognize that in terms of GDP, Russia has been pushed out of the top 10 by Canada and South Korea. And if there's a significant 10% shock to the economy this year, which some people expect, that means Russia is going to be pushed down to 15th place just ahead of Mexico. And when we look at military spending, in terms of the US and China as the biggest spenders, when we look at the NATO spend compared to Russia, that's a trillion dollars compared to Russia's 48 billion. So when we look at this in perspective, it's a huge challenge for Putin. We talk now about Moscow on ice, the process of isolation, containment and exclusion. And with the development of the embargoes of oil and gas from the West specifically, this means there will be real challenges for the Russian economy um, in this year and in the years ahead, but also that's creating shorter term problems for the Western economies, especially in Germany or Europe, where they're dependent on uh, Russian gas. I have to say, believe it or not, two years ago, I was in Moscow as a guest of Gazprom talking about the digital disruption. And being in Moscow at that time, it was just an incredible, just great city that was. And looking at some of the best restaurants in Moscow, the Moscovites are not going to take kindly to a reversion to a Stalinist style economy. Anyway, that's enough of the, the, the Russian situation. But when we looked at our wall of worry last year, we did note the challenge of global conflict and global tensions. No one expected the Russians to move into Ukraine. Not even analysts better uh, qualified than me to look at it. But we do do our dimensions of international strategy where we monitor 15 world hotspots and 10 conflicts to watch. But no one quite saw this one coming. Next, we've got to be careful of how the, the Allies react to what develops in the South China Sea. 
Anyway, that's enough of that sort of geopolitical overview. What we want to do is look at the economy. So the economy is or was growing at an eye-popping rate. And in the IMF world growth forecast in January, they were talking about world growth this year of 4.4%, down from 5.9% last year. And when we looked at the growth projections by region, they were still pretty positive. But the IMF are due to publish their updates in April. And we know that we've heard from Kristalina Georgieva, we're going to hear from her, and also from uh, Gita Gopinath in just a few moments. But generally, they're talking about lower growth, as I said. The IMF are talking about lower growth and higher inflation. And they'll put some colour to the numbers uh, next month. So here's Kristalina Georgieva talking about the economy now. Russia invaded Ukraine when the world economy was yet to fully recover from the COVID-induced crisis. What we were striving for is for growth to go up and the inflation that has become a problem to go down. Instead, we had the exact opposite. Growth is going down, inflation is going up. And we are assessing the impact of the war and the sanctions in different parts of the world and different categories of countries. Yeah, so what we know is that the impact of the uh, Ukraine crisis is going to, has led to escalation of commodity prices, specifically nickel, coal, wheat, corn, platinum, gas and oil. And it, it varies the impact in terms of different economies. Now, what we tended to not think about so much in the UK is the impact on uh, food costs. And here's uh, Gita talking about uh, that specific issue. Russia and Ukraine together account for about 30% of world's exports of wheat. Uh, it's around 15% for corn. And we may not have seen the full effect yet because we know, for instance, for wheat, uh, what matters is the harvest that's coming around the summer. And with disruptions to that harvest in the summer, we could see even bigger effects in terms of food reaching different parts, reaching different parts of the world. So food prices have gone up. In many parts of the world, that just means lower real incomes because they have less money to spend on other things. But in other parts of the world, like Christina mentioned, in parts of Africa and the Middle East, uh, in Asia, as you mentioned, we're talking also about real hunger. We're talking about deprivation, food insecurity, the social tensions that come along with it. So this is a major concern, and the longer this war lasts, the, the more grievous the problems become. And here the cap up is Christina. Third again. are the countries that depend on imports of energy and food from Russia and Ukraine. Energy primarily, of course, from Russia, food from both Russia and Ukraine. And it is devastating for those that have high level of dependency. To put it very simply, a war in Ukraine means hunger in Africa. Yeah, so hunger in Africa and also we've seen the impact on fertilizer costs and so on. We talk a lot about oil. We will talk a lot about oil and the significance of oil in the, um, the impact on inflation. And when we look at we think that, you know, in, in a couple of years ago or 2020, it was trading at $20 a barrel. Now it's trading at 116 maybe this morning. And generally we think it could trade below $100 through the rest of the year once we get through the early parts of Q2. But a lot of speculation about what will happen. Also speculation about commodity prices. So what is the impact going to be on the world economy? The OECD have given us some clue. The suggestions are the war in, Ch in, uh, in Ukraine will damage the economy by about 35%. 10% could be the impact in in, um, in Russia this year. In the euro area, it could be just under 1.5%. In terms of the USA, maybe 0.7%. Um, and the world as a whole, around 1%, the shock there. So we're trying to assimilate those shocks into the system. And similarly, the big impact on inflation with the euro area possibly over 2%. And in the world at large, about 2.5%, the shock of prices on top of what was expected in any case. Looking at world trade, we know that world trade increased by 11% in 2021, causing all these incredible problems of supply difficulties and shortages on this, difficulties on the sea with the container traffic. This year, we think it's going to be around 6%, maybe a little lower now, around 5 given disruption. But it's still leading to big disruptions in trade and as that shipping, those shipping containers move around the world. 
Now again, we thought the transport costs were going to ease, but actually they're rising again with the cost of uh, shipping from China to the west coast of America, about $15,000 now compared to the benchmark of $5,000 we're used to. So these big inflation shocks are really significant and the shock of uh, food costs is going to impact in Africa. But generally for the West, it will mean that we're looking at lower growth and also uh, higher inflation. Now looking at China, the second largest economy in the world at the moment, they stacked up growth of 8% last year and they penciled in growth of 5.5% in the current year. No adjustments will be made to that number at the moment, but we know there are challenges because of COVID lockdown and additional challenges in terms of maybe demand from the West, but their target of 5.5% is intact at the moment. And we know this region in the world, we talk about it every time we speak, this is return of the Middle Kingdom, the dominant economy in the world, a dominant, dominant economy in the world economy, this impact of China and the Asia Pacific region. We still think China will overtake the US as the largest economy in the world by 2030, and it's set to double in size by 2035, second largest economy in the world, struggles to get into the top 50 in terms of GDP per capita. And we'll talk about the impact of the dollar because of this, that when we look at trading, we know that trading at the moment is dominated by the dollar and the euro on the swift transaction basis. The, the renminbi not featuring at the moment, but here's Gita again talking about what could happen to the dollar strength in the future. If you ask me today about does this imply the imminent demise of the dollar, I would say flat out no. But that's not, that is not the case. But what we are seeing uh, around the world is increasing fragmentation of payment systems that probably will, will further increase following this war. Uh, we are certainly seeing changes to global trade. For a fact, we know that energy trade will never look the same again uh, after this war. And we are likely to see countries, some countries, reconsidering how much they hold of certain currencies uh, in their uh, reserves. So fragmentation is indeed uh, an important concern. And we know that typically, and I've worked on this issue of what generates the dominant currency, is usually currencies have complementary roles. They, comp they have a role in a payment for a payments. They have a role as a store of value. Uh, and if we find that there are parts of the world that are moving on to making trade payments in another currency, not the dollar, for instance, or they start starting to save in other forms of uh, currency assets, then we could see pockets where uh, we, we might see shifts happening. Now, the longer this war continues, and depending upon how it rolls out, I'm just hoping that this ends as soon as possible, but we could see much more uh, larger effects. Yeah, and there what we're talking about, obviously, is the fact that <clears throat> uh, A, the transactions between Russia and China may well, will probably not take place in terms of dollar, but they'll be in the renminbi. And equally purchases from uh, UAE or from Saudi Arabia by China will equally push towards a renminbi base as opposed to the dollar base. So, and equally, it, you know, the, the sanctions have been a warning that to, to, to um, China specifically, 1.3 trillion dollars of reserves that they don't want to see them frozen in some Washington bank account anytime soon. So we're not talking about a swift transition here, but nevertheless, it's a marker about the future strength of the dollar. We saw it with sterling in the early 20th century. And we saw it with the, 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 now we're seeing the early signs, but long process that it will take. But it's a benchmark warning when we look at the strength of the dollar moving forward. We're going to talk a lot about the USA at the moment. Um, the USA trade deficit surges to a record high as trade with China continues. We know we, help, we, we wanted so much from the new administration, but there have been squabbles in the White House with the Dream Team. The important thing here is what is happening to monetary policy, and uh, we're going to talk to listen to Jerome Powell. Talk to listen to Jerome Powell in a moment. It's important to understand this sort of switch that's taking place in monetary policy between the Fed, the Bank of England, and the ECB. We'll hear from uh, Jerome Powell in a moment, as I say. We'll hear from uh, and Andrew Bailey, and we'll also hear from uh, Christine Lagarde. Different positionings, but we are leaving Planet Zerp. Good afternoon. I want to begin by acknowledging the tremendous hardship the Ukrainian people are suffering as a result of Russia's invasion. The human toll is tragic. 
The financial and economic implications for the global economy and the U.S. economy are highly uncertain. At the Federal Reserve, we are strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. Today, in support of these goals, the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by one quarter percentage point. The economy is very strong and against the backdrop of an extremely tight labor market and high inflation. The committee anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate. In addition, we expect to begin reducing the size of our balance sheet at a coming meeting. Economic activity expanded at a robust 5.5% pace last year, reflecting progress on vaccinations and the reopening of the economy, fiscal and monetary policy support, and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses. The rapid spread of the Omicron variant led to some slowing in economic activity early this year, but cases have declined sharply since mid-January, and the slowdown seems to have been mild and brief. Although the invasion of Ukraine and related events represent a downside risk to the outlook for economic activity, FOMC participants continue to foresee solid growth. As shown in our summary of economic projections, the median projection for real GDP growth stands at 2.8% this year, 2.2% next year. Yeah, we're going to move on because the, the projections we're going to deal with in some detail, but this is the J Jerome Powell talking in March. And really it was a, a, a big sea change in attitude about um, the hiking of rates, where so they're talking about rates going up to 2.5%, 2.75% in the next couple of years. And in more recent statements since that was done, that was a couple of weeks ago, even this week now, the, the, the Fed are being more hawkish about uh, the prospect of rising rates. Everybody hopes they can achieve a soft landing. Everyone hopes they can achieve uh, rate rises without disruptions to the market. But the more markets react in such a positive fashion, the more hawkish the, bank, uh, the Federal Reserve will be. And that means the Bank of England will follow. So when we look at the growth forecast, we were looking at 4.5% in 2022 at the start of the year for the US. We've seen the downgrades coming from uh, from the uh, FOMC in December to 4%. And now the FOMC in March, they're talking about growth of 2.8% this year. Not quite sure why it has been so radically downgraded, but uh, they've now got these fancy new charts which you can look at. They're looking at growth of, uh, say, 2.8%, slowing to 2.2% and so on in the, um, in the years ahead. And when we look at the prospects for unemployment, here we've got some benchmark numbers of 4.5 or 4. Uh, the FOMC, the Fed in December and March, they're talking about the outlook for um, labour markets still being pretty good at around 3.5%. This is their fancy chart. I thought I'd let you have a look at that one. And when we look at inflation, they're still relatively benign on inflation, despite the fact that inflation producer prices were 10% in February and uh, CPI prices or CPE was around uh, just over 7% they still reckon they're going to get it under control towards the end of the year. So no, no real alarms about inflation in the US. And as I say, when we look at the, the monthly forecast, you're probably going to peak around 9 or plus in terms of CPE, but slowing towards 4.5% by the end of the year. The big change is what's happened to interest rate policy. This, for those of you who are not familiar with this, this is the blue dot. It's a bit like the um, where FOMC members uh, do blue dots on a chart it's a bit like pin the tail on the donkey, but slightly more advanced in terms of monetary policy planning. Um, they do their blue dot outlook of what I think is going to happen to interest rates uh, in the years ahead. And when we look at the chart, the summary chart, we cover this in our Friday for guidance. But um, generally, the USA, they're heading towards 2.75% uh, by 2024, uh, base rates that is. And the UK, we think the UK is going to be 2 or even 2.5% by 2024. And the euro at the moment, the Lagarde, we'll hear from Christine Lagarde uh, in just a few moments. Big change in interest rate policy, really good news for pension fund deficits. If you get your actuaries in to look at the impact on bond yields, we know that bond yields now, we talked about them heading for 2% in, in the US, heading for 2.5% uh, anytime soon. We're already through our first level targets in the UK and the US. So um, interest rates rising, bond Internal deficit, the problems for the US economy still persist. The deficit is going to shrink in the years ahead, but they still have this trade problem, which argues that um, the strength of the dollar 
uh, over the medium term will be not quite as good as the scenario we've been looking at. And debt, just over $30 trillion. This is a great website. You go to the US Debt Clock and you watch these figures scrolling in real time. I urge you to have a look at that. OK, what's happening in Europe? We pencil in 4.5%. Suddenly in OECD March, they're talking about 3.1%. And inflation rate... Mm, in the EU, they're still pretty... We don't see no shocking figures yet, which we should do, about what's happening to inflation. And also, we should be waiting for a much more positive reaction from Christine Lagarde. Here she is speaking this month. When it comes to uh, interest rate uh, hikes, we have a forward guidance which has been approved by the Governing Council, which identifies uh, three particular, three pillars or three criteria, if you will, uh, that uh, need to be satisfied in order for uh, rates uh, to, um, to be hiked. And I, I don't want to insult you by repeating <laughs> those three criteria, but um, I will, yeah, actually. She will. So, yeah. here, they, here they come. Uh, we have the um, uh, inflation at target, which is 2%, well ahead of the projection horizon. We have, second, the durability, so that we see it staying at target uh, until the end of the horizon. And third, we need to see underlying inflation that is uh, sufficiently strong to determine progress towards target. So we will apply uh, these three criteria at each and every step of the way, and we will determine if and when uh, they are satisfied in order to uh, possibly uh, hike rates. But don't forget that we also have a sequence and the sequence is that we will not hike rates until we have completed uh, net asset purchases. So I think, you know, what comes first comes first. We have to look at uh, net asset purchases. We are conducting a step-by-step -step, uh, glide of those net asset purchases. We will determine uh, in March what is the assessment what on the basis of the data that are then available and and we will see what uh, what pays what speed what amounts uh, we will uh, we will apply to this uh, net asset purchase programs for the rest of 22 yeah so there you go no need to worry just yet it's all looking quite fine but actually we've seen the rapid change in attitude with the fed we've seen the bank of england picking up speed and we see the ECB at the moment still lagging behind in the adjustments which will have to be made for central bank monetary policy in Europe. You can check out some of the hard numbers on the uh, Sutton Economist website under our Friday Forward Guidance page. So that's a recap of um, the, the world economy and uh, Europe and the US and China specifically. Now we're going to look at what's happening in the UK. And specifically, we'll look at the forecast updates. Here's Ed Conway with a more extended interview with the governor. You have just decided to raise interest rates. You have told us that inflation is going above 7%. This feels like a big moment for monetary policy in this country. Can you explain what's happening? We're having a very big shock, um, particularly from the prices of things that we buy into the country, so particularly energy, gas. I mean, you know, wholesale gas price has gone up, I think it's around 400% in just over a year, for instance. And also quite a lot of traded goods that we buy in from other parts of the world. And by the way, one of the things that's gone on in the COVID is that there's been a sort of shift from spending on services, you know, going out and so on, to buying more goods. And that's around the world. I mean, this country is part of it, but it's by no means the, the largest part of it. And that, is, that has caused higher inflation. Um, energy prices, particularly the gas price, have been extraordinarily volatile as well. Now, I have to tell you, you know, we can't use monetary policy to directly tackle the causes of these increases. But what we have to do is use monetary policy particularly to limit what we sometimes call the second round, the second round effects, the follow-on effects. Uh, and that's a hard message I understand for households because it's a matter of saying this is having a negative effect on, on, on income. Yeah, I think it's always good to see uh, to get a chance to listen to the, the Governor of the Bank of England, as with Jerome Pearl and um, Christine Lagarde, to put some of these leading figures in context. So 
when we look at the specific numbers, we were projecting last year growth of 7.5% in the UK, which has come in more or less on track. And we expected growth of about 5% or just over 5% this year. Now, what we're seeing now is a downgrade. Uh, the IMF were downgrading to 4.7%. But in this, we look at uh, this year, we think that growth now, we think growth is going to be around 4%. Um, the OBR came in yesterday at 38 and then, if you like to look into the, the um, magic glass, they're talking about 1.8, 2.1, 1.8. Not quite sure what all that's about. But if you assume that growth is going to be 4%, why? It's an easy number to work with. And that the trend rate will blow out about 2.5% next year. Then the trend rate is around 2, 2.1% moving forward. That's a basic scenario, our guidance at the present time. And we can track that in terms of the, the relationship over time. But it's what we're grappling with now is struggling to come to terms with the prospects for inflation. So these are the annual averages that have been talked about. And when we look at the inflation forecast by quarter, we can, it looks as if inflation is going to be about 6.2% on CPI basis in Q1, rising to average 7.8% in Q2, and then slowing towards 5.5% uh, by the end of the year or up and into 2023 20, uh, at 5% at start. So this is inflation no longer quite the transient phenomena we'd all hope for. The OBR forecasts are a bit strange, really, because they're talking about in the bottom right, um, the slight skips out on the forecast for Q1, but 7.7% in Q2, then 7.5, then 8.7 by the end of the year, because they're modelling in the sort of um, second round effects of the off gem price gaps, which we can't get quite get our head around at the moment. But it's certainly going to be much higher than had been envisaged at the start of the year. What we tend to look at is the impact of oil, because we had this incredible inflationary shock of oil prices. So looking back, if you think at uh, in Q2 2020, oil was around $29 a barrel. In one specific month, they were paying people to roll the barrels away because they were actually, yeah, oil prices were negative. Now they shot up trading at 115 um, this week. But there is so much spare capacity in terms of uh, OPEC, the spare capacity in terms of, you know, we're talking to Venezuela now, we're talking to Iran. There's still a lot of spare capacity in the US. The oil rig count is about half what it should be for oil prices trading at $100. So we still think that, you know, this inflationary shock from oil prices will ease towards the end of the year. But we know a lot of other uh, issues are crawling in there, especially uh, with energy prices. Everybody's focusing on energy prices. Looking at the labour market, <clears throat> the outlook for the labour market appears to be as yet incredibly benign. That we model uh, unemployment about 4% uh, through the year. The OBR uh, around a similar level, so no real shock there. In terms of the numbers, it looks about 1.4 million through towards the end of the year. It was just under that in uh, in January, February for the latest figures that we've seen. And when we look at vacancies, we know there's 1.3 million unemployed. There are also 1.3 million vacancies in the economy, which is creating all sorts of recruitment difficulties. I know you'd be focused on that specific issue, but all sorts of recruitment difficulties uh, and retention challenges. And when we look at what we call the UV ratio, the relationship between unemployment and vacancies, it's dropped to an incredibly low level in 2022. And we see just a modest pickup um, through uh, the rest of this year uh, and into 2023. <coughs> vacancies by sector, big recruitment challenges in health and social, retail, accommodation and food and professional services. Big recruitment challenges around the board, uh, but uh, this means that earnings are going to stay quite strong. We always thought they'd come off the highs that we saw in 2022 of over 8.7 percent in Q2. And when we look at this, because it follows our trend line adjustment chart, but looking at uh, where we were, we see uh, earnings slowing towards the end of the year. But, you know, this is as yet to be seen what could happen there. Um, earnings, that's a chart. Employment figures looking good. And when we look at the spending review, well, the latest uh, borrowing figures suggest that uh, borrowing this year could come in around £150 billion, uh, pounds, which is higher this is based on the data to february only one month ago and again the obr have got some strange number in of 127 billion which is difficult to get to grips with but generally we model um 320 billion last year almost this year financial year about 150 billion the um obr have got 127.8 billion 
not quite sure where that comes from. But then slowing to 99, we've got 90 and then 50 uh, by 2023-24. Uh, but, you know, lots of time yet for the Chancellor to blow those numbers away. And in public sector debt, uh, public sector debt at 2.3 trillion. That's about 94% uh, of uh, GDP this year, uh, moderating in terms of relationship with GDP, and uh, but still picking it up to quite uh, eye-watering levels. And a lot of talk this week about the cost of borrowing uh, for government. Bear in mind, a big chunk of that debt is owned by the Bank of England. And as I've said many times, <laughs> the Bank of England is owned by the uh, government. It owes the Treasury um, has the debt, the Bank of England has the asset, but both the Treasury and the Bank are owned by uh, government. So one day with a bit of subtle interbank uh, or intercompany adjustment, a lot of that debt could fade away along with the interest bill. Quick look at trading goods. Uh, the trading goods deficit evaporated last year. It's back with a vengeance this year at around 30 billion uh, in 2022. Uh, again, the OBR, they're, they're slightly more pessimistic than we were. A lot of talk about impact with the EU. Uh, well, what we've seen is uh, no real change in terms of trade with the EU. If anything, imports coming in uh, are more weighted towards non-EU trade at the moment and away from uh, the EU, uh, from EU. So much for the Brexit miracle. Finally, we're going to look at uh, the spring statements. A lot of talk about the spring statement. Uh, as I was saying to uh, colleagues at Prativity and Robert Half, we weren't expecting much from uh, uh, the Rishi Sunak in his spring statement. And in that sense, uh, we weren't disappointed. What we've seen is uh, um, an impact on the fuel duty levy, 2.4 billion, 5p on a litre. That takes it back to where it was probably a couple of weeks ago at level at the prices at the pumps. We've seen an adjustment to the national insurance charge. The fact that it raised national insurance to ring fence the money, hypothecate the money for the NHS, 9.5 billion. Now he's given 6 billion away to level up. And of course, the throwaway line about income tax cuts in two years' time at a cost of 5 billion. This is really cynical backbench appeasement of an appalling dimension. But here, here he is talking about his announcements. So I'm announcing three immediate measures. First, I'm going to help motorists. Today, I can announce for only the second time in 20 years, fuel duty will be cut. Yeah. Not by one, not even by two, but by five pence per litre. Yeah. I can confirm before the end of this parliament in 2024, for the first time in 16 years, the basic rate of income tax will be cut from 20 to 19 pence in the pound. Yeah. For pensioners, for savers, a five billion pound tax cut for 30 million people. And let me be clear with the House, it is fully costed and fully paid for in the plans announced today. Yeah, not sure what that means. But anyway, here's the thing that, you know, meanwhile, corporation tax is zeroing up to about 25 percent. The hopes of the um, Singapore style Britain now derided as fantasy. Yes, unlike the party opposite, we have a plan. Yeah. A plan. A plan that reforms and improves public services. A plan to grow our economy. A plan to level up across the United Kingdom. A plan that helps families with the cost of living. And yes, a tax plan that cuts taxes on working families by over £330. Yeah. Cuts taxes on fuel by five pence a litre. Yeah. Cuts taxes on business. And yes, for the first time in a long time, cuts income tax. Yeah, yeah there you go. Richard Sunak taking credit for tomorrow today. Finally, we'll leave the last word with um, Kristalina Georgieva. So my main message to the audience is we have to learn to deal with more than one crisis at one time. Yeah, there you go. OK, I'm going to wrap it there because I'm not going to talk about markets this morning, but I'll just stop my screen share and come back live hopefully. That's great, John. Thank you ever so much. Um, yeah. Really appreciate that. As ever, 
full of statistics and um, lots and lots to think about there. So um, I'll, I'll start with a question based on, based on one of the ones that's come through on the chat, but my ask to everyone here is please do put your questions in the chat or even better, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you and, um, and we'll come to you. So John, first question, please. Um, if you were sat in front of a CEO, um, this is from Rupert, if you were sat in front of a CEO, you've talked around, around a huge number of variables there and uh, you know, things that are happening. What would you be advising them to focus on at the moment and consider? I think you have to revisit the basics of your um, <clears throat> business plan and strategy and go through um, the first level check, the first level audit again of what you're actually trying to achieve. Then inevitably you've got to look at um, the implications of um, the debt and the borrowing situation. And then you do your scenario analysis about what the growth prospects could be in the UK and around the world. But <clears throat> it's the big issue we face is not so much at the moment the challenge to growth uh, and the usual recruitment difficulties, but what is going to happen to inflation and what's going to happen to central bank monetary policy. So back to basics, revisit your basics, make sure you do your scenario evaluation. And above all, check out the implications for a debt uh, on, the, on the business and have a look at those pension fund deficits. They may look, be looking a lot better than they currently are in a year or two's time. Okay, thank you. So you, you showed your slides, kind of linked to that, you showed your slide earlier on, on your wall of worry, um, yeah. which and so we, we discussed that and actually we got everyone here to contribute to that in the last, um, the last meeting we had. What would be top, what, what would be the top five things on your wall of worry at the moment then that you'd be talking to that CEO about? And, uh, well, they've got to be um, growth. They've got to be about uh, recruitment, staff retention. They've got to be about um, the prospects for inflation, supply side difficulties, interest rate policy fundamentally, because we're going through this big shock. It's modelling those impacts on the on the business um, balance sheets, uh, but also the prospects looking forward. So yeah, it's it's a <laughs> It's a complicated world, it always was. And that wall of worry, you know, um, now we've got to worry about the threat of uh, nuclear weapons as well. So there's quite a lot of uh, to talk about and uh, yeah, it could be a lengthy conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So question, thank you for that. Um, question from Hannah. Um, do, you, do you think the surge in oil prices is going to be accelerating the ESG agenda? and the green economy? Well, that's a good question, because if anything, what we're seeing is saving the planet may just have to wait for the moment, because we're looking at ways of bringing more fossil fuels on stream quickly, both in the North Sea in terms of gas, but also the sort of uh, a revisit to the questions about in the US, what we've seen is, you know, the current level is $100, but the gas rig that the oil rig count should be about 900 and it's currently about 500. So that's been held back for a lot of issues, including ESG, but there's a lot of pressure from government now to get those oil rigs pumping again in the US, to get the uh, gas fuels pumping again from the North Sea and to bring Iran and Venezuela uh, back into the world fold. So saving the planet may just have to work, uh, wait in the short term, but if the price levels persist, then the push to alternative fuels, which should be easier. So short term, ESG, same the planet, may have to wait a little bit, but generally the trend has to continue, which is one of the big themes. I didn't put those clips in, but one of the big themes that the IMF are ready to push. An important issue, but at the moment, the big challenge is um, getting Europe off, weaning them off that uh, Russian gas, specifically in Germany. Absolutely. Thank you, John. I mean, any if there are any reactions to that, or uh, you know, please please do raise your hands, and uh, we'll we'll come to you. But in the in the absence of that, I'll I'll move to the next question. Um, do you think, and you you kind of betrayed I think some of your thinking around this, and you said it, but do you think Sunak has done enough to in the in the um, in the spring statement to help drive the UK economy into 2023 and where it can be, and if not, what? What more do you want to see to address some of the things you've mentioned? Well, the spring budget was always going to be a non-event, really. I mean, he had to, what his priorities to be to A, uh, appease his backbenchers, B, to position himself better for the move next door, 
and C to make sure the headlines would look good the following day. Now, he's achieved some of that with the back benches, not all. Not sure he's done much to improve his chances of moving next door. And the headlines this morning are not too good at all, really, because, you know, it's quite, and the IFS are quite scathing because they focus a lot on uh, welfare economics and the impacts for low income groups and middle income groups doesn't read too well there. Um, and I think that you know, in terms of the, the, the momentum for the UK economy, we came into the year with pretty good momentum, which will be maintained. So we still think that we'd see growth this year and next. The issue is coping with inflation um, and reacting to Bank of England monetary policy. But really, you know, to, to announce the national insurance increase, which he did so-called to ring fence for the NHS, and then to make the changes to allowances is contradictory. Um, logically, it's a good logical move to increase the, to, to level the benchmark or opening rates for NEC and, um, and income tax. But generally, it doesn't read too well amongst the serious analysts. And to throw in the tax cut at the same time that corporation tax rates are rising and, and national insurance costs are rising for business, it just looks like a cheap political gesture and it should be um, outlined as such. So I, I think it was disappointing in that sense. As he's done enough, he didn't do much. So it won't really, really change issues um, in terms of momentum for the economy. So what, what would be the big what would be the big things that you're looking for then to really drive the UK economy into 2023? If you were if you were running the shop there, what would you what would you be looking to tweak? <laughs> well, I think you've got to let markets run, really. You know, you, there's, there's, there's no scope for the, the national the debt is coming. The borrowing levels are coming down, but they're still quite high. National debt is high, but um, economies have their own momentum. We have to look at the challenge we're going to face from higher inflation, the squeeze on incomes. Having said that, there's a lot of talk about the 200 billion uh, coffers that have built, built up by consumers last year, that a lot of it managed to spend on housing. But nevertheless, the, the balance sheets of, 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 um, of households are in good shape coming into the year. It's a question of standing back and let that momentum take place. And you're have, going to have to take the hit from uh, central bank adjustments. So I think for the, you know, there isn't scope for them to do anything. We don't want to see, you know, why cut corporation uh, income tax from 20% to 19%? It just makes the arithmetic more difficult. Why not look to level up as you do with NIC um, starting rates and also income tax starting rates? Why not look to level up the corporation tax and, um, and um, income tax at about 20%? So the, if anything, you should look to cut the level of corporation tax uh, to create that um, momentum for business. And I, I think those are the, the, that's the key thing really at the moment. Thank you, John. Um, I believe Phil has his hand up, so we'll come to Phil next. Oh, yeah. Can you, can you hear me, Paul? We can hear you, Phil. Yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, so I'm kind of conscious that the recruitment market in consulting but also many of our clients is pretty crazy and, and and we've heard terms of you know haven't seen anything like this in the last 20 years i'm just conscious with the inflation and your sort of thoughts on what's that's going to happen in terms of wage price inflation and 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 how that might make the market even worse than it is at the moment or or, or challenging i should say yeah, I think that's a good question because we've seen in the US and in the UK the downgrade to growth figures for the US economy and the UK economy. We haven't seen those adjustments to the labour market at the moment. So uh, the labour market is still going to retain, in terms of um, the unemployment rate, still going to remain remarkably low. Uh, we do see, they do see more uh, participation rate in the UK increasing slightly as more people come back into the workforce. So that should ease the level of vacancies uh, from the highs of 1.3 million that we've seen. Uh, and also there's a natural sort of swing down in terms of the, you know, we, there's, there's figures of 9% or 8.7% in Q2 last year for wages. They were an anomaly because of what happened the previous year. So at the moment, economists, we also, we always like to see this return to the mean, the return to average, uh, return to kindergarten maybe, but uh, you know, the, the wages moderating to about 4.5%. The disparity between vacancies and um, unemployment easing towards the side of uh, recruitment, but it's going to be a tough call. And I think um, 
what what the central bank wants to avoid is this escalation in wages because if we see that then the rate of increase in interest rates could be even higher so from a recruitment perspective slightly lower growth still a tight jobs market improvement in the ratio in terms of uh, the number of vacancies to the employment level should lead to some slight easing but there's a new psychology in the in the uh, jobs market especially with the uh, generation z uh, we talked about this last time we're not talking about it today but it's a more difficult world in terms of recruitment and a more difficult world in terms of retention which means that um, you know means you're getting commissions more frequently through the year probably thank you phil thank you john um again please if anyone else have questions please put those hands up um i'll come to the next one in the chat um john how do you think the uk is going to be faring versus the world economy over the next few years so so how do we compare to those peer markets and why yeah well i think uh, the oecd and the imf will be touching on this and the imf specifically in greater detail next month but generally uh, well, if you look at Asia, there are relatively, um, especially the Chinese economy, lots of um, central government support there. That's going to be the strongest growth pattern uh, for setting the, the, the path for the dynamics for, for growth in the world next year. The US equally, USA, North America, still looking quite strong with growth penciled in at around 3%. Not even sure why it's so low. But when we look at forecasts for the UK, it's going to be about 4% this year, then reverting to trend about 2.1%. That's about a similar rate, trend rate, that we'll see in Europe. But in the short term, or this year, then the shock to the European economies will be greater because of the um, dependency on Russian oil and gas and the markets there. So the UK should look good compared to what's happening in, in Central Europe, uh, but still you know, doing well compared to the USA. Not quite as well, but uh, not quite as well as uh, the, the star performer, which, which will continue to be in Southeast Asia. So, yeah, uh, it still looks pretty positive. But, you know, uh, Brexit, not a great fan of Brexit, uh, especially now with the consolidation of EU economics and NATO. Uh, not a great fan of that. And we don't see any great surge in prospects for exports to the rest of the world. But, yeah, for those reasons, the trend rate of growth should slow to 2.1% in the next uh, 18 months, which is a similar growth pattern we'll see in Europe. But in the shorter term, the UK will do better or appear to do better. So let's look at the markets then. Um, let's start off with commodity prices. Do you think we've reached a pike, um, sorry, a peak in commodity prices? <laughs> well, uh, that's obviously a zillion dollar question. We model oil quite a lot. And, uh, you know, I think even the OBR, they've got oil coming down to about $80 within a couple of years time. Certainly trading over. And the big thing with OPEC is OPEC will tolerate they like high prices producers like high prices as long as it doesn't lead to demand destruction so if we see demand destruction taking place on oil where demand is weakening then they'll pump more oil to bring the prices down and uh, generally we know there's lots of capacity in OPEC as I said lots of capacity in the US and lots of capacity in Venezuela and Iran and also we'll bring uh, new alternative gas streams on stream quite quickly but uh, the big shock is absorbing the, the, the Russian adjustment in the shorter term. But yeah, we see oil peaking. We don't see this call of $150. We didn't even see $100, but you know, $150 oil. No, oil will, should be peaking, but we may have heard that before. And commodity prices equally. We'll look at um, the spikes that we're seeing. We saw it in nickel. Uh, we're seeing in alternative commodity prices. We've seen it in, um, in food prices now, especially in wheat. But these spikes, they look like spikes. And hopefully we will be seeing the peaks, if not already, then sometime soon. Wheat's slightly more difficult because we've got a, a growing season coming up and that's going to be hit by fertilizer prices as well. But generally, yeah, oil prices, uh, commodity prices generally, they've got to have peaked and they've got to start to revert to towards the norm okay. sometime soon, towards the end of the year. Okay, that should begin to make a difference at the pumps in the longer term. But um the, the markets in general, John, I mean, with all that uncertainty you've done, we're still seeing markets rise. You know, we're still seeing volatility, but overall we're seeing some short term rises. Are we heading to a longer term bear market or should we expect rises off the back of that? You know, you're saying we we're looking at average kind of 2.1 percent growth. What, where do you see the markets in general going? 
Well, generally at the moment we see, we model nine markets every week with our uh, Monday morning markets analysis. <laughs> and when we look at the markets in um, Asia, they, they're, looking, they're looking oversold, <clears throat> especially the Hang Seng and even though Shanghai, but Hang Seng in terms of um, tech prices, we've seen just great recoveries in what we call our empires of the cloud fund. So markets in, in Asia look oversold. Equally, markets now in Europe, FTSE looks level pegging, but oversold in Germany and France. And in the US, uh, at the moment, the trio, the Dow, the S&P and NASDAQ, they look about 10% overvalued, NASDAQ maybe six, but still some adjustments potential there. But there's just so much money around, so much liquidity that it's supporting uh, equity prices. Big sell off in bonds because bond yields have got to rise. And, you know, we normally would expect bond yields to rise to about 4.5%. Uh, the, the Fed think they should be much lower than that. But generally, equities look good value. Uh, bond markets, not so much. Um, but yeah, the momentum is there. There's so much liquidity. Okay, so generally you're optimistic then from that from that longer or from that short, medium, and even long term kind of growth in the markets. On equities, yeah, because uh, we saw you know the markets trying big sell offs on a couple of occasions now in the last six months, and generally it has, they've, they've been recovering. So U.S. slightly over over overvalued, but uh, big recoveries. You know, buy when the tanks are rolling into the abyss should be the guideline for many. We've seen the recoveries in Asia uh, this week and last week, and we're seeing uh, the potential great recoveries in uh, Central Europe, in Germany and France specifically. Okay, thank you, John. Well, um, there's, a, there's a question in the chat about, your, about the Ashcroft optimism barometer that I'll, that I'll come with. I'll come to you in a minute and you can close with that. Just before we do, um, we haven't spoken much. I think you mentioned Brexit once, the B word. Um, I mean, the last yeah. few days, John, we've seen U.S. tariffs lifted for us still, and and we've also lifted, I think, tariffs for for Harley Davidsons and Bourbon. Do you, do you think the collective concerns that you've been talking about today, we're going to be seeing? Do you think we'll see a drive in some of those UK trade deals? Well, uh, this. Uh... Yeah, there's, there's a, we're entering a new world of rapprochement amongst NATO members, really. So EU, USA, NATO, a lot of want, wanted people to, you know, Russia is Russia is bad. The rest of the world is good. We're still not very sure about China. But um, yeah, there's going to be a move to, 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 to level the deck between the US and the UK or the US and Europe, because the enemy, the common enemy now is Russia. So yeah, there could be some momentum there. But um don't get your know, hopes up over much and and in terms of what you're seeing and what you're predicting in terms of the real effects of brexit has that been how's that compared to your expectations kind of a year or so ago well it's like to say about you know the french revolution it's too early to say if it's a benefit but i think that uh, brexit what we're seeing at the moment is um the the switch between imports, so greater imports coming from non-EU countries now, a drop in trade from uh, Europe itself, and exports really hit a little bit, but not too badly over much. So, yeah, not not nothing too too damaging and nothing too over exciting. So to thank you, John. So so to wrap us up then, John, um, on the as I say on the Ashcroft optimism barometer. <laughs> <laughs> where are you compared to where you were at the end of last year and where are you directionally for this year looking forward? Well, I think, you know, if you've been reading the stuff I'm writing, I, I was very shocked and disheartened and despondent and in a level of despair about what, what's happening in the Ukraine. And I think the, um, the Russian invasion and the devastation we're seeing in Ukraine is, is quite appalling. And uh, Putin and Russia should be placed on ice in the process of isolation, containment and uh, exclusion for some time to come. So we want to see an end to that devastation and quickly. But for the world economy, yeah, we're reasonably positive. Great excitement to see what happens with inflation and great relief. We're leaving planet ZERP. We're actually leaving the world of negative rates and zero based rates back to the reality of real rate rises and positive bond yields.
Fantastic. John, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. We're at the top of the hour. Thank you very much, everyone. We've run out of time. Um, but if you like what you've heard today, please feel free to contact us at Pativity and Robert Half or indeed John himself. And as I say, please, you, you, you'll see the link to the Saturday Economist here in this chat. I'm sorry if I didn't get directly to your question, but um, as I say, you can please come to us with those directly and, and we can be delighted to talk about them. There'll be a video of our forum posted on our website, so please share that with your colleagues, friends and LinkedIn contacts. So until next time, John, on behalf of all here, on behalf of the Petuity Robot Half Team, I'd like to thank you very much and thank you to you all for joining us today. Um, we'd like to extend our best wishes to you all. Stay safe, be bold, be kind to each other. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you very much, everyone.